Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. We are at South by Southwest. This is a very special edition of Fast Forward, and my guest today is Ed Boyd, the Senior Vice President of Experience Design at Dell Technologies. Dell, of course, makes everything from laptops and desktops to enterprise software and cloud storage solutions. We're going to talk about AR, VR, AI, and really the future of design and technology. Ed, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Talk to me, you know, people are familiar with Dell as a, as a technology company, it's yeah. Dell Technologies now, yeah. but um, design is a huge part of almost everything Dell does. You know, how does, the comp how do you, how does your role fit into the company? Um, you know, the, the, the design group's charter is really to help define um, the experiences that we, that you know, our, our end users are after. And so, you know, we will, um, we help the company dive into different um, markets, different segments, look at how people are using technology, the current pain points that they're having, issues and challenges, not only with, with our stuff and other people's, um, but really what they're trying to do. And we're looking both short term and we're looking long term, like five, 10 years out in the future, the types of things that we know they'll be doing long range. And so we work with uh, strategy teams to develop you know, business plans and strategies around what those types of products and experiences look like long term, what short term things we can do to really help people, and so we're, you know, the, the voice of the customer, you know, in this, you know, big voice. So a lot of people look at the laptop and the desktop space, obviously yeah. core to what PC Magazine has yeah. been covering. Sure. And they say, well, you know, laptops haven't changed that much mm -hmm. in the last five years, in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, they've plateaued in some ways, particularly in terms of design. Mm -hmm. Like, what innovations have you seen in, like, the plain old laptop and desktop space? Well, you know, now you're seeing things like, you're saying, you know, um, you know, just like the automobile has evolved and it's evolving toward an autonomous vehicle, you're seeing the computer change where it's evolving to a device that, you know, it's a place where people still go to get their work done. So in, in all of our, you know, interviews and testing and research, we see people using um, client devices to sit down and, and be productive. They're using mobile devices and other things as well, but um, that isn't, hasn't changed. We don't see that changing that much. But we're, what we're noticing is that we're, what we're doing is we're building new experiences to help drive productivity to the next level. The, the, the way I look at the, the maybe the last wave of compute was more around command and control. So you know I have a range of different devices today. There's a graphical user interface on them. I have to tell these things what to do and how to do them. Um, it's a little daunting and frustrating for a lot of people. As we look forward in time, we see um, you know the role that AI will play in the user experience and advancing it to make things a lot easier and simple and more automated and anticipatory. Um, we see um, the role that immersion is going to play in the user experience, like helping people stay focused and in their flow while they're working. Um, so we're working on a lot of interesting things to help you know enable that. Um, as well as you know how people collaborate, we like the PC in general was not is a is an amazing tool to produce something. It hasn't been a great place to uh, collaborate with multiple people to get, get to work on the idea, and so we're working on that stuff as well. So we think like you're going to see compute radically change as you know with these three kind of mega forces. So you know AI and intelligence, you know collaboration and immersion. Those three things are really going to change the way computers look and behave and act in the, you know, down the road. I think the, the command and control nature of it, which yeah. was the power of it, and it's certainly the origin of the personal computing revolution, I think we're really seeing that we sort of played that out now and that you know people are overwhelmed by... With one device, it's okay. Yeah. When, with four or five devices, it gets daunting. And when my data is everywhere, in the cloud, on the edge, and I'm trying to figure out how to manage and move things around and make sure that it's safe and secure, it's kind of overwhelming. So we want to flip that on its head and uh, and use some of these advancements that are coming, uh, you know, in the in the technology sector to really make it easier. I think the um, the point where it flipped it may have been the introduction of the Apple Watch, where everybody ran out and grabbed one, and now they're getting notifications on their wrist every time they got a text message, mm -hmm. and people don't want that, yeah. and they, and they don't want a notification every time they've got a meeting to go to, yeah. and yet then they've got to go into the into the settings and then change the settings and. And, and it's just, it's too much stimulation yeah. and it actually hurts your productivity. Yeah. yeah. And, but an AI could know that, yeah. you know, this is, when, this is when you want notifications, this is when you don't. Exactly. When you get to work in the morning, this is your routine, you take it every time. Oh. And, um, and that's, the, and it, it could set your desktop for you based on your habits. Yes. And really adapt to you. Yeah, totally, yeah, exactly. And I think those are the types of things that we're, that we're incubating and, and prototyping in our studios. 
and uh, we can see huge benefit when we can anticipate what people are trying to do and help them do it without having them stop and get out of their flow. Um, and, you know, you know, I'm sure you've had these moments where you're writing and you're 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 in your groove, and all of a sudden you look up and hours have gone by. Mm -hmm. You you were very productive. Um, it's really hard when you have a lot of distractions, you know, today. Yep. And so a lot of the longer range things that we're working on are really aimed at kind of just calming that back down and uh, letting you focus on the work at hand and quieting down messages and, you know, uh, pop-ups and other things to make sure that that's just, you know, not, not distracting. So there, there are a lot of really cool AR and VR demos here at South By. Yeah. Um, really more than any other year, it's like an exponential number of, of deployments. Um, most of them not consumer ready, most of them um, still very much demos. But I also found most of them to be very entertainment oriented, very gaming oriented. Yeah. Um, it, when are we going to see AR and VR sort of move into more of the productivity space where it's it's more useful and telling people how to do things, or, or, or is that not going to happen? No, it's totally going to happen. And, you know, I think that the technology is still in its early phases, sub phase of development. Um, it's, been, it's been going on for a long time, but, uh, you know, the headsets are still bulky. Um, the field of view in general has been very limited. Um, you know, the battery life, wire tethered connectivity has been an issue. But you know, hands-free, uh, you know, um, interaction, uh, you know, using uh, using AR is really good. I, I like to think about it maybe a, little, a step back, and I, I'm thinking more about augmentation. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I augment an end user to um, with, and provide them with the information and the insight to do the tasks that they're doing in a, in a more natural way? So whether I'm wearing a pair of AR glasses or I'm projecting that information or using other displays to provide the augmentation or audio feedback, like I'm trying to augment and give you the things that you need to do the do the task at hand mm -hmm. the best way possible. So that's starting to happen now, and we're engaged in all of those activities. Um, you know, from the data center and providing the data analytics, all the way to the edge devices, including the headsets. Headsets still have a ways to go, you know, in my opinion. So they're, they're heavy and they're they're isolating, yeah. fundamentally isolating. So that when you're doing, when you're in that experience, you you really are yeah. not doing anything else. Yeah, you can't do anything else. Yeah, and you know, try to do it for a long period of time. It's not the most comfortable thing today. The um, one of the things that you know, we were in the in the midst of this. Um, smart assistant, voice assistant revolution. Um, many people have either a Google Home or an Alexa in their house. A lot of people have more than one. Yeah. Um, and so it's, but it's very much a consumer phenomenon. Mm. Do you see any role for voice assistants in the workplace? Yeah, voice assistants being threaded into a lot of the, in, in the workplace. You'll see Alexa in a lot of our devices um, as well. Um, why aren't people using Cortana? Like Cortana is built into every Windows 10 system, and deployed yeah. on everybody's desktop. And yet, you know, I've never seen any. Only in PC Mac Labs when we're testing yeah, stuff do we see anybody use it. It's successful, I think. You know, um, Amazon obviously has made uh, deeper penetration, so the user experience has been better. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think the other folks have struggled a bit more. So you know, like Siri and Cortana and others. You know, the, the technology is evolving. It's not quite at the level where it's just is more like natural conversation. Yeah. But it's coming. You can, you can see it getting better and better each generation. Yeah, it's um, there's a, almost a uh, chicken and egg thing where in order to be successful, you need lots of data yeah. and a large user base in order to figure out how to do natural language processing and figure out how people want to use the yeah. tool. As, a, as, a, as an experienced designer, we're always looking for, you know, like the most natural, intuitive way to perform a task. Voice we see playing a huge role in that. And so, um, for specific know, tasks or just for any, like, what do you? Not what, for can, what can voice do better than a keyboard? There, there's, there's no one input method that it, you'd want to use for everything. So it's, it's finding the right input method for the task at hand. Um, you know, there's, there's things that, um, like, if I'm working on a project and I could just tell uh, the application that I'm working what to do and it could take care of it right, versus me pulling down some menus or do, you know, using gestures or whatever, it's probably way more natural. If I'm standing up giving a presentation, I'm saying, hey, next slide, and it flips the slide for me, uh, or I do a gesture and it does it that, that way, there are ways that will make the user experience, you know, th those types of input methods will make it more natural than you know, clicking a button or um, grabbing, you know, all, all those things. So that, those are the types of, um, you know, emerging new input methods that are, you know, are, are piloting and, and playing around with a lot. 
Is there uh, another thing that's happening this year is that we're finally getting 5G rollouts. Um, it's going to go city by city. It's going to be pretty uneven at first. But um, does, does having does 5G change how you think as a designer in terms of what you can do and what types of products and services you can create? Yeah, I mean, 5G obviously opens up new spectrum. Um, it drops latency and it allows a lot, a lot more throughput. I, yeah, I think that you're going to see, um, you know, um, new experiences like I can, um, I can, you know, use VR or AR to attend, you know, um, concerts or other activities in, in a real remote way um, because the connectivity and the throughput is so good. Um, I can do more. I can shift more of my my data and, and applications to the cloud. Um, I think you know you're always going to be in a model. Um, the IT industry runs on this idea around efficiency. Okay. So whatever is the most effective, efficient way to perform a task, you'll take that. If I had an autonomous car, I'd probably be less excited about having my my decisions driven to the cloud and back down. I okay. want that at the edge. So we're seeing actually growth in the edge uh, demand as well as cloud, and um, I think 5G is just going to make that flow a lot better. Yeah, I've read. It's going to take a long time to roll the infrastructure out. You'll see, you know, um, China and other countries in Asia roll up the infrastructure a lot faster than, than North America. Mm -hmm. But um, because they're more centralized and they can manage competition. The the infrastructure uh, cost and the infrastructure cost is, is massive. So yeah. it'll take it'll take a while to ramp. Okay. Um, but we're we've been designing. Um, you know, 5G antennas and other you know aspects into our devices and into the user experience as we speak. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not easy. We're uh, we're actually tracking on PCMag.com the the rollout of 5G zip code by zip code. Yeah. As they light up, we find out how fast the networks are, and, and each carrier is being uh, graded on a rank to 100 for a full 5G nationwide deployment. We're thinking it's going to happen in 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to say somebody's got a nationwide network, yeah, that makes um, sense. but it's going to take a while. Yeah. The um, in terms of the applications, one of the things I, I, people keep asking me: Why do we need 5G? What is it? You know, my phone is it just going to be a faster cell phone connection? But it's really going to change the types of devices that and types of applications you can use. Yeah. Is there anything you're really excited about seeing that's going to be based on 5G? I think a lot of the, you know, if you think about IoT in general, you think of a lot of the edge devices and sensors that are, are expanding, you know, exponentially. You'll be able to connect those devices and get, um, you know, a much stronger uh, connect, connection back to the cloud. Um, so that is coming. Um, the mobile devices will be more mobile. I'll have less interruptions. I'll be able to, you know, get um, big files, big data, move those around uh, effortlessly. So, um, You'll start to see, obviously, that 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 type of transformation, you know, and the, the whole IT industry. Have you? Uh, what do you think? We, uh, RSA was just a couple of weeks ago, last yeah. week, and um, one of the takeaways, and we knew this was going to happen, is that we're in the middle of the Internet of Things. We've got all these smart home devices, and almost all of them have security problems. problems yeah. um, and, and part of it is because they're they're just poorly designed. Mm -hmm. Like they they were rushed to market. Security wasn't factored in. Um, but I mean, you know, when it comes to building this next generation of devices, like what are some of the design concerns that that manufacturers, Dell and others, should really think about before putting these products in somebody's home? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's really a, a, exactly it's how the data is um, being handled, and managed, how it's being secured, you know, um, at the edge, in route uh, to the to the data center, and then ultimately how the service provider is. Um, you know, their, their policies around the data itself uh, that we utilize. Um, you know, a lot of our customers are very worried about that. So those are the types of things that, you know, we're thinking about at, at RSA and uh, SecureWorks as well. I want to ask you some of the questions I ask everybody that yeah. comes on the show. Um, is there a technology trend that concerns you or something that keeps you up at night? Um, no, you know, I, I think like less of a concern for us. Like we're, we're, you know, as as a designer, I'm, you know, there's been things that I've wanted to do for a long time, and um, now the technology, we're we're at a point in time where the the um, compute capability, the processing, battery life, those technologies have advanced to the point now I can do things, and with AI and ML coming into play, I can really start radically changing the user experience. You know, designing an interface that is command and control versus one that's based on intelligence, mm -hmm. they're radically different um, problems to solve. Um, 
uh, more interesting, uh, you know, uh, in, in my opinion, on, on the, uh, the next wave of compute. And so those are the things that we're spending a lot of our time, you know, up late at night working on, actually. Um, not worrying about as much as we are, you know, just thinking about how do we really, um, you know, change the way that people interact with, you know, one another and their information. I think that's a really good point, because I think yeah. people think about AI and Alexa and voice interfaces, everybody's got an intuitive and yeah. experience using Alexa, but that, that conversational interface needs to be designed. Yeah. It needs to work a certain way. It can't just, and it, you can just say mimic a human yeah. and that's done. It's going to, and that's going to take a long time to get to that level, yeah. right? So you're seeing fundamental things happening now where it's more in the, you know, mundane routines that are being automated um, mm -hmm. and simplified. But longer term, it's like, hey, how do I have more of a companion like, you know, help and assistance mm -hmm. to help me do the things that I'm trying to do? Is there a, a product or a service that you use every day that still inspires wonder? Um, man, I actually just use Waze on the way down uh, here, and um, I, I, I'm always blown away at how smart it is at rerouting me through all the, tra yeah. the traffic. It's the you know, combination of, you know, uh, social and, and data. Uh, you know, the GPS data mixed together is amazing. Seamless. So you yeah. see, I mean, in, within 10 years, GPS went from something expensive, custom, um, a little wonky and slow mm -hmm. that you would buy and tack onto your dashboard to. Can't live without it. Yeah, now yeah. it's gone. Yeah. And people are using GPS just to get around Austin, yeah. a city block yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. even a place where I know where to go, it's just yeah. like I want to get there the fastest way possible and it's fantastic. Yeah, but right now Austin's being overtaken by scooters, yeah. Um, yeah. but it, you go right into the Uber app and you see the location of all the scooters that are literally littered all over the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you couldn't have done that uh, just a few no. short years yeah. ago. Amazing. So how can people follow you, follow uh, Dell's design work and uh, keep track of what you're doing? If you go to dell.com forward slash design, you can see some of the latest uh, design work and advanced vision uh, pieces that we put together so you can see what the design team's dreaming about. That would be a great place to, uh, to start. Great. Yeah. We'll do that and we'll, uh, maybe we'll highlight some of that on PCMac.com as well. Awesome. Great. great. Thanks for doing yeah, this. Thank Thanks you, so, yeah, so much for talking yeah. to me. That's Fast Forward for today. You can, you can see past episodes of Fast Forward on PCMag.com, on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'll see you in the future.